Now, let's look at this. And you notice my title changed to a concerned doctor. So Dr. Cookson very appropriately mentioned the screening guidelines. All right. And, and this is what we're dealing with now. In 2012, the AUA came out, or not the AUA, sorry, the United States Preventive Service Task Force came out with a D recommendation. It threw the world into a tizzy. And remember, it wasn't just in 2012 they did it. They did it prior to that. They were telling us that there were some issues going on, and everyone started to get too nervous. And they said we shouldn't be doing it. And then 2017, everybody got excited because they said we're going to change the recommendation. We're going to make it a C. I remember I, I called Dave that day, and I, I said, did you see it? And he goes, yeah, it's a C. And I'm like, they screwed this up even worse. All right? A C doesn't help me. All right? It makes them feel better. Because they, they answered all of these, you know, they're, they're still putting the onus on me. They're saying shared decision making, shared decision making. You got to do shared decision making. All right? That's great. It's great if you're sitting behind the ivory towers, pushing a pencil, and not seeing a patient. It, it absolutely bites if you're trying to do the right thing for the patients. But everyone jumped in on that. The AUA, ASCO, ACS, everyone jumped into shared decision making. So let's look at that. There are three tenets of shared decision making. It's a provision of information. It's an elicitation of patient perspective, which is talking about your prior experiences, understanding and discussing concerns, delineating preferences, and guiding final decision making. Okay? So. I'm going to ask my primary care colleague in the audience, how do we do this? You know, patients come to us in a primary care setting because they want us to help them. What would you do, Matt, for your family? What would you do for your wife, your father, your uncle, your brother? All right? Imagine the shared decision making. Imagine this. I was talking to a student of mine recently. This is like me going to the auto shop and saying, I need a new muffler. Or the, and he goes, well, Dr. Rosenberg, let me explain to you what a muffler does. And I'm like, Jesus. All right, let me talk to you about um, what happens if we change the muffler, OK? Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, have you ever changed your muffler before? All right, and, and how do you feel about the muffler? Are you going to miss this? Are you going to have some, you know? And then I, I'm not going to actually tell you what to do with your muffler, Dr. Rosenberg. I'm going to ask you to make that decision. All right, I mean, how obscene does that sound? But that's what's happened with shared decision making. And for the people who've recommended it, they have not done primary care. They don't have any idea. You know, Dave said in his talk that it's a 15-minute conversation. Uh, Dan, when we, you and I were doing that video last year with Dan Petroli, a uh, friend of ours who's a uh, uh, radiation oncologist at uh, Yale, he said, Matt, medical. medical oncologist, excuse me, he said 22 minutes to do shared decision making. And I'm looking at that saying, awesome. That's awesome because I'm doing more of these in primary care than anybody, right? And you obviously have an extra 22 minutes per patient per day to talk about prostate cancer, right? Forget about the fact that you're a poorly controlled diabetic with an A1C of 9, that you haven't gotten your, your eye checked, so quality measures are out the window. Forget the fact that you can't afford the medications that I've just given you. The reality of it is I need 22 minutes to do this in a disease state that I'm not a specialist in. All right. I, am, I am a specialist. I am the master of everything, because right? that's what I'm the knower of everything. I'm maybe not the master of everything, but I have to know everything. All right? But this is not what I do. And, and we talked about it earlier. In, in primary care and in internal medicine, we might have had a day or two of urology. Internal medicine is not required. In primary, were you, are you family medicine or primary care? Or is internal medicine? Family. So do you have any training in urology? Your husband, there you go. <laughs> so osmosis. So his, yeah, there you go. So you get it through osmosis. But the reality of it is that we don't have that kind of training. So we're not the specialists to be able to do this. So we, it doesn't make any sense to do this. And the reality of it is when they looked at shared decision making, it did not work. We've tried this before. We've tried this in colorectal cancer. We've tried this in breast cancer. We've tried it now in prostate cancer. It fails miserably. No surprise, I could have saved you a million dollars for a study to tell you that. All right? This is a study from 2015, looked at uh, patients who were eligible for this. And look at the data. It's pretty obvious. Only 22% had told us that some doctors recommended it. Only 14% had any idea if it saves lives or not. 10% received all the tenets of shared decision making. That's probably 9% more than I would have suspected. You know? And 55% are getting the PSA, and that bothers me. 
because really everybody should be getting that. But shared decision making doesn't work. And the reality of it, and I think Dr. Cookson mentioned this, is that we see decreased screening because we're scared of it. We're scared of the PSA, we're scared of the rectal exam. We have decreased screening. When we have decreased screening, what are we worried about? Metastatic disease. All right, and what have we now seen in the literature? More metastatic disease. Okay, well, what are we gonna do? I mean, it's obviously we're doing the wrong thing here. And the diagnosis of prostate cancer, this is some older studies, it showed it's gone down since they've, adju they've adjusted these recommendations. It's gone down. So the people, the proponents of no screening are cheering, yay! Less people are getting screened, and you guys are looking at this saying, crap, more people are getting metastatic cancer, because we know people have that, right? And what if we're wrong? You know, what if, what if we're wrong on this stuff? You know, and, and, and I think part of the problem is that we, you know, David mentioned before, or Dr. Cookson, we would, other disease states would give their right arm for a screener, all right? But in prostate cancer, we've taken a different effect. Think about breast cancer. If people, we don't go through shared decision making for breast cancer, you get a mammogram. You, get a, you do a breast exam monthly. If, if people didn't die of breast cancer as much as they did, or because people die of breast cancer as much as they did, we screen because it's the only thing we can do, all right? Because they die. With prostate cancer, you guys in the audience, you do a really good job keeping people alive. So because we don't, people with prostate cancer don't die as readily as people with breast cancer, we have this question about screening. But the question really we should ask is, do you want to be a 70-year-old with metastatic prostate cancer and getting all the therapies that we're going to talk about at this meeting, or do you want to be a 70-year-old with no cancer at all? All right, so the screening debate is, is only because we do such a good job with it and it's the wrong thing to do. So the question that, that Dave and I have worked on for a long time is the simplification of this process. How do we simplify this? And I was asked this uh, a couple years ago. Dave asked me to, to present this concept. And the, the idea is how do we simplify this? Well, we don't want needless evaluations. We don't want to make unnecessary patients. I mean, Dr. Cookson had mentioned that, you know, people get worried because we do too many radical prostatectomies. All right? Well, actually, I get more worried because we do too many prostate biopsies. Nobody likes a prostate biopsy, all right? And if they get one, they ain't getting two, all right? And patients will come to my office, I'm sure you see that, and they're like, you know what? Don't even check because I'm not doing this again, all right? That's a needless event. And you, you, people get sick from that. And what is the cost? Here's a good one. What is the cost of urosepsis? What is the cost of an infection after a biopsy and put the patient in the hospital? I mean, those IV antibiotics are more expensive than my yearly income. We don't want to ask the primary care to counsel outside of their comfort zone. So this whole idea of shared decision making is odd. Doesn't make sense. Why are you asking me to talk to you about something that I'm not a specialist in? Can we simplify the PSA value? And if we're gonna make primary care happy, we have to have evidence. We have to have information that is based on evidence and beyond dispute that the patient has to be presented with a clear framework for decision, it has to be appropriate for primary care. Whoever wrote these guidelines, whoever made up this whole idea of shared decision making and screening wasn't thinking about us, wasn't thinking about what is the best way for us to treat the masses that don't get treated, all right? I mean, it's, it's a great time to be a primary care provider right now because people can't get them. You know, I, we haven't advertised for new patients in 20 years. I saw six new patients yesterday. And their answer was, I'd like to say they come to me because I'm good. They're coming to me because no one else will take them. <laughs> no one else is opening the doors. No one else will see them, and we just don't have that policy. So we need, we need this stuff that assumes that we can do this in a good period of time. We don't have these two. So the question is, can we simplify screening? And, and this is just a schematic I want to present, because this is how I look at it. And when I talk to lay people, you know, in, 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 in lay public uh, lectures, I talk to primary care. Think of it this way. This many folks get diagnosed with prostate cancer a year. This many men die of it, all right? Which means all of these people get this unnecessary treatment. That's the donut. This is my target. This is the sweet spot. How do I find that sweet spot how can I make this process work? And David approached that before with using different things that we have available, biomarkers and MRIs, things like that. So we want to find that patient who is at risk for the aggressive life-threatening cancer. So can we use 
This is the question they should be asking instead of shared decision making. Can we use what we have right now in 2017 to find a sweet spot? And this is what we know. Dave already talked about this, 1.5. We have now published two papers on this. We've presented this in a lot of different places. The nice thing is it's gaining momentum because it makes sense. All right. Dave presented a distribution. Let me show you something else here. This is a paper from Aus that I combined with a paper from Vickers, which shows very clearly that the risk of prostate cancer starts to go up at 1.5. Years ago, I remember reading a paper in the White Journal that said your risk of prostate cancer, if, if your PSA was low, and they picked one, your PSA is less than one, your chance of cancer is essentially zero. I remember quoting that for years, all right? It's low. Patients come in, they're concerned. Oh my God, my PSA is 0.7. I'm going to die. No, it's actually pretty good. You're fine. All right. And this study actually did it a little more specifically and said, you know, below 1.5, your risk is very low. Above 1.5, it starts to go up. It's still low, but it starts to go up a little bit. This is an older paper. This is a paper from uh, Sweden, which if you look at blue, blue is no cancer. Red is cancer. That's your cases. And look at that. Look at that, at 1, 1 1.5, you're there. What are your chances of cancer? Very, very low. It starts to go up here. So the PSA, remember, PSA is prostate-specific antigen. It's not prostate cancer-specific antigen. And that's what we have to teach our colleagues here. So a low PSA actually does tell us a lot. And a higher PSA tells us, yeah, maybe we need to think about it. And there's a final study, or a final graph from that prior study, which shows here that when your PSA starts to go up, that's when we start to see cancer above that one level, above the 1.5. So we have a very good argument we're making. And Dave already showed this. 27% of our patients have a PSA of 1.5 or more, which means 77% have it lower. 73%, sorry, I can't add. So now we think about shared decision making. It takes a whole different view. Wait a minute. If we use this like a vital sign, maybe I only have shared decision making when I'm concerned, when it's a problem. And here's an analogy in primary care, all right? Who's been to their family doctor or their intern at any time in the last whatever period of time, year or so? Did they check a blood sugar? Of course they did. Did you question them checking their blood sugar? Of course you didn't. A blood sugar for the most part, how specific is a blood sugar? It's not, <laughs> but it's screening. We talked about it with diabetes, or not diabetes, with OAB a minute ago, right? If it's high, what do I check? I check an A1C. I don't rush you to the endocrinologist for insulin. I check an A1C, right? So guess what? Now I have my PSAs of risk right here, right? PSAs of risk. Now I look at it. So, aha, we have the algorithm. We have the algorithm that Dave and I published with many, many others. Actually, a funny story. You know why we have 45 on this? You saw his prior algorithm, he had 50. I wanted 40, he wanted 50, we cut the baby. All right, after arguing on the phone. Seriously, that's as scientific as, as we got. But, <laughs> but, but why we did this, this is a start. This isn't the end product. This isn't the guidelines as written by the AUA or ASCO or United States Preventive Service Task Force. This is a logical way of thinking about this. What happens? We get a guy, we screen them. If your risk, if it's 1.5, sorry, less than 1.5, your risk of cancer in your life is pretty low. Great, that's awesome. If it's 1.5 or above, now I'm going to look. Now I'm going to get the A1C, the prostate equivalent of the A1C, which is a biomarker, all right? Further investigation by a PCP, a urologist, I'm going to get a 4K, a 5, a PCA3, a select MDX, whatever you're going to get your hands on, you're going to assess risk. And then if the risk is high, you're going to evaluate. And that's, this is where shared decision making comes in, right here. That's the most sense, because I only have to have it with the appropriate patients, just like blood sugar. I'm not going to talk to you about diabetes if you're, without checking your sugar. That's a total waste of my time. But if your sugar's high on your screening labs, I'll call you in, or you'll have been there for the physical, and I'll say, you know, your sugar was 125, it was fasting, I'm going to check this. And there's shared decision making. Then I'm talking about the risk. So there is a better way to screen for prostate cancer. We use the PSA as a first-line test. We get, you know, suspicious PSAs are then shared, or then start with that shared decision making. So what have I learned over time? 
You know, what I've learned over time is throwing out the PSA is really throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I, I, first of all, I don't want to get a PSA in somebody who's, who's, who's not healthy. You know, if you're a 50-year-old male coming into my office, status post a bilateral BKA, breathing through your trach tube but still smoking through it when you remove the oxygen, right, I'm not checking your PSA. That's a bad idea. On the other hand, if you're an 80-year-old male on your way to go play tennis with your dad, I'm probably going to check your PSA. So I, I actually, have dis, I, I've decided I'm insulted by the guidelines when they put age parameters. All right? You can't tell me, as a urologist, sorry guys, I don't mean to be disrespectful, it's not, you can't tell me the patient's health. I'll tell you, that's what I do. You tell me prostate health, you tell me general urinary health, I'm going to do the overall patient thing. That's what I do. So do I put age on it? No. I just went to a birthday party for a patient of mine who just turned 100, right? She was dancing with me on the floor. She kissed me. There was some tongue there. It was really awkward. But, but I mean, and you know, a 100-year-old birthday party for a doctor, that's a victory dance, right? <laughs> we get to do that. I'm like, yes. Everyone's like, you're the doctor, you're my man, right? All right, but I will assess health, all right? So we focus on age, we focus on health and quality measures. You know, I, I, we made a point of do we refer, if, if the primary care are not comfortable, then we refer them, but we have to get them comfortable. You know, what, do we need high volume prostate cancer centers? We probably don't, we need education. All right, we need to focus on those who don't need treatment. Maybe we need risk calculators. The bottom line is actually, we just need to have our eyes open to what this test can do and what it can't do. So I wanted to kind of end by showing you what I've done in my office. This is a snapshot of a 12-month period that ended in March of last year, so we're going to be updating it soon. Well, what I did, I like using the 4K score in my office because it's easier for me and I don't need a DRU before that. And, and that's an important point. Dave talked about the urine-based studies. Okay, some of the studies need a rectal exam before. Primary care do not like doing rectal exams. All right, we just wrote an editorial, or I did, that Dave helped me with. We called it Make the DRE Great Again. And we just published that a few months ago. And the bottom line is the DRE is more important than just the prostate exam. But you don't want to give it up. But if you come in for your prostate, you come in for your physical, I do a prostate exam, your labs come back, your PSA is abnormal, now I get a biomarker, I'm not going to do two DREs on you. All right, you ain't going to be happy. You know, maybe, yeah, this is not going to happen. Maybe if I send you flowers the night before, but it probably is not going to happen. So you, I use a 4K because of that, and a lot of my colleagues find, because you don't need the DRE for that test. So what we found was we had, uh, these are patients, and I'll show you the criteria, who, were who had a screening level of the PSA 1.5 or more, okay? Now, I want to I wanna explain that one a minute, because what about a stable PSA? If the PSA has been stable for five years at 3.2, 3.2, 3.2, 3 the chances are I'm not going to evaluate it. All right, so when we talk about 1.5, as that is for the fresh virgin PSA. Is everyone following that okay? All right, good. So in my office, we, we had 94 uh, 4Ks that were done for the reasons I'll talk about in a minute. 41 were less than 7.5. Nothing needed to happen. Nothing, I'll follow up with you in a year. I'll check the PSA again. If it changes, I might reevaluate, but the risk shows me that it's low. 53 had a 4K above 7.5 equal or above, so those patients were referred off, all right? 42 consults, 10 are pe were pending at the time of this snapshot, one refused. Of those who got it, they had a conversation with the urologist and a decision was made. Now, we're working on a paper right now to talk about what decision process has to happen to get a biopsy or to not get a biopsy. And I think we need to clarify that a little bit, but that's time for another discussion. Oh, and the data, as you see, of the 20 biopsies, 15 were negative and 5 were Gleason greater than 7. So, you know, 25% rate, you know, because we were selective here. This is what we used as our criteria. If I, I looked at those 94 patients and I said, you know, if I looked at my old criteria, a PSA greater than 4 if, if greater than 6, older than 60, greater than 2.5 or equal to 2.5 if age great, less than 60, a nodule, right? or a velocity change, we would have referred 69. If I use an intelligent algorithm, the one that Dave and I have published, 4K score greater than 7 or equal to 7.5, a prostate nodules, 53 referred. All right? Think about the importance of that. 
we, re we reduced our referral rate down. We have made this a cleaner process. Is it a perfect process? Absolutely not. Are you still going to get those patients that get disease, as David mentioned? Yes, you are. But the, the question is, by making this better, by screening this and using an intelligent way of going about this, are we improving the outcome for the patient? Are we creating less patients? And I would say we absolutely are. So finally, what have I learned after many, many years now of working on this? Prostate cancer screening saves lives. It does save lives, all right? And it saves people from metastatic disease, and it saves them from getting all the therapies they don't want for metastatic disease. We are the gatekeepers. So as you use all these guidelines and you look at what these do, remember that it affects primary care because we're doing the majority of these. And if you make it difficult for us, the most likely response is, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. We want to avoid testing in men to with little or no gain. We need to teach that. And if we're, and when we define the, the better way of doing it, this is what you do when you go back to your primary care colleagues next week. Say, look, I know there's a controversy with the PSA, but let me show you why it's a valuable first-line test. Let me show you when shared decision-making should happen only in that 27% of patients that have a high PSA. There is a sweet spot, you'll find it. You'll have a consideration for a biomarker then. You don't need to worry about it before. It's like a vital sign, as David mentioned. And 1.5 is hugely important. If you could teach this to your primary care colleagues, forget about all the various numbers you heard about the PSA, focus on 1.5, you're gonna make their life easier. And instead of 23 minutes of shared decision making, you're gonna make a 15 second determination of what to do and to do the right thing. And we're going to be effective with that.